All right, you guys ready? One, two, three. My soul! I give you C Man.
going? Safe. DMX going? DMX going safe. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Kolmuja. Seventh-day Adventist Church along with the United Believers of Delray. Um, we have come together today first of all because we love Delray Beach. Yeah. I want to hear you say it. We love Delray Beach. We love Delray Beach. Because we love Delray Beach, we want to make sure that we are doing everything that we possibly can to make sure that not only does Del Bre Delray Beach stay as good as it is, but if there's any way that we can make it better, it's opportunities where we have to come together like this that provides the platform for us to be able to contribute to making Delray Beach the very best that it can be. We are grateful to have with us the Delray Beach Police Department. We've got representatives from the Florida Highway Patrol that are here. We've got the Sheriff's Office that is here. We've even got the FBI that's out here. Uh, we've got Greta, who's our, our, our fearless leader at United Believers of Delray Beach. Greta, wave your hand there. Um, and we also have with us, who's going to give us our opening prayer for, did I miss anybody else that we have here today? Oh, we got Sam, Seventh Avenue Church from Papano Beach. And we love Papano too. No, y'all are supposed to say we love Papano. We love Papano. All right, all right. And we have Pathfinders here. Where are the Pathfinders at? All right, you guys did a great job. We also have with us today Pastor Helvis Moody. Pastor Helvis Moody is the Director of Young Adult Ministries for the Southwest Region Union based in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we know that he was with you guys at Salem today. He, his wife is with him. Miss April is in there. Wave your hand. Uh, we're happy to have her as well. And he comes from a very unique perspective. And we may have an opportunity to hear a little bit of that either now or later on living in Dallas, Texas, also having pastored in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, and he's come and he's going to give us our opening prayer and just a few remarks. Um, Pastor Moody, we're going to give you the time at this point. Everybody else welcome Pastor Moody. By the way, he is an old classmate of mine from both Oakwood 
we didn't go to Oakwood University. We went to Oakwood College. They didn't have to turn it into a university. That's how old this brother is. And then also at Andrews University in Michigan. So good classmates here. Here you go. Hello, everybody. I'm excited to be here with you. Thank you for what you're doing. Extremely excited to see that the church and the community is working together with law enforcement. As was stated, I do live in the Dallas area. I was assigned to federal court on the Monday to the Thursday that took place where uh, precious lives of officers were gunned down. So we even, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, along with all of the churches the very next day in the Dallas area, had something in the community. It's always important when we bring people together because the purpose is to reach others and to be a blessing to others. I also pastored in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the shootings that took place in Baton Rouge is extremely dear. We have a church off of Fairfield Avenue. You saw that area on the news constantly. And one of the things that I do is I deal with young adults, specifically the ages of 18 to 35, and trying to share with them and empower them their role in life, their purpose in life. Every last one of us, we have a purpose in life. And what I share today with the church is that every generation is important. And although we live in a society in a time where many people don't really value much, we're still valuable to God because he made us. And every life is indeed valuable because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Can everybody say amen to that? Just to give you a quick perspective, when I pastored in Houston, Texas, I was a part of what they call PAC. That's police and clergy team together. And in that assignment, you had to do ride-alongs. You had to go and go through some trainings in the police department so that if there is a situation of domestic violence, they had a minister along with the pastor to try to defuse the situation. Then also I'm a part of what they call the constable team as the chaplain. When we invest in the lives of the community, we see a difference. So I'm overwhelmed with joy to see the Delray Beach Church here, the police department, the state department, everybody working together. And when everybody work together, we all make a grand difference. Even if it's a little difference, a little difference becomes much when you place it in the master's hand. So let's continue to join our forces. Let's continue to join our prayers. Let's continue to join our hands. So whether it's the FBI, uh, whether it's the sheriff's department, whether it's a precious life in the community of a public school or a private school, when we all work together, we understand that we're all important and we thank God for his son Jesus who died so that we all can be saved. Thank you, and may God bless all of your efforts, and let's pray together. Our Father and our God, as we come together in this community, thank you for being a beacon of light, and bless and protect every officer, bless and protect every family. And when all is said and done, we simply pray that we will be saved in the kingdom of heaven. Now bless our time together. May it be educational, may it be encouraging, may it be empowering. In Jesus Christ's worthy name we pray, amen. Thank you, Pastor Moody. We just uh, forgot to mention my old college roommate, who is the pastor of the uh, Salem Seventh-day Adventist Church. Pastor, De I'm sorry, not Pastor, Dr. Dion Henry, where are you? Right. Dr. Henry, are you here? Where are you at? Come, come just give us a, a brief hello, very brief. You got 30 seconds. I know this brother, I gotta give him 30 seconds so he'll take two minutes. Uh, all right, come on up, come on up, hurry up, hurry up, put your snow on down, give it to your wife. Yeah, come on, come on. Your people are saying you gotta represent, just quick. Good evening, everybody! All right, well, I'm just so glad to be here to support my friend, my colleague in ministry, Pastor Paul, doing an awesome job at Delray Beach. And I know that as we continue to join hands with the community, God will bless us. I want to praise God for our police officers. Let's just give them a round of applause for our police officers. We respect our police officers, and we're so glad that they have joined forces with us as we minister to this community. May God bless us as we continue to learn more about what we can do in this community to establish a good relationship between the community and our officers. 
Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, we want to welcome you and we want to thank you um, for coming out, taking the time out of your schedule. The reason why we are here, joined alongside of law enforcement officials, joined alongside the um, United Believers here with us, and we're working together so that we can foster an environment for change. This could be the beginning of change for our entire community. When we start to come together more, we understand each other more, we'll love each other more, and we'll be saved together. Amen? Amen. So we welcome you. This is why we're here, and we're excited to have such a, a collaboration between all of the different um, districts and law enforcement and different churches, uh, community representatives coming out, and we thank you once again. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. And on behalf of uh, United Believers of Delray Beach, it has been a privilege and a pleasure to work alongside Daughter of Zion, uh, Mike, and I tell you, we've just been kind of uh, encouraging one another and, and confirming, you know, some things that, that God has placed in our hearts. So everything is what it's supposed to be, and it's happening here today, and it's because of you and all of you are coming out to support what we're trying to do. And let me just say this, that uh, United Believers is a made up of uh, pastors, uh, congregations, and other believers who are trying to make a difference, a profound difference in the community. So when we all come together as a body of believers, it's nothing that we cannot do. And so we have to make sure that we are uh, that we have aligned ourselves with the Word of God to make a difference in the community. So thank you guys again for coming and we look forward to a tremendous uh, United for Change rally. Just one thing I just want to add. We got to thank God. Oh come on somebody, we got to thank God. At 3 o'clock this afternoon, it was pouring and raining. The young people were putting up the tents, bringing out the chairs, and, 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 and it just started to pour. And they looked around at each other, they huddled underneath that same tent right there, and they're like, what are we going to do? They said, we gonna pray. We assembled together inside that church, all of the young people, and I'm trying to tell you, there's, there's power when you unite and come together and have God in the middle, right? And so they started to pray and started to, 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 to sing praises and proclaim in Jesus' name that rain or shine, we're going to line up at 4 o'clock. Rain or shine, we're going to share the love of God throughout this community. Rain or shine, we will let this rally continue to go forward because somebody needed to hear this. This is life and death. And so God was able to do it. He did it and threw a little cool breeze with it. Amen. So we're excited and we give God all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Thank you. So um, next, uh, uh, who we have on the program to, to jump us off, um, and let me just say this as well. When we're talking about change, we know that that's a matter of the heart, right? It, it starts there. And that we all need to take a look in the mirror and have a real conversation with ourselves and what we believe. And, 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 you know, nothing is off the table. We have to have that tough conversation throughout the community and with ourselves, and we have to be honest. So uh, along those lines with, with change, we have to be transparent, we have to be open, we have to be honest, and we have to be willing to uh, look at ourselves and, and, and you know, ask ourselves some tough questions. So next we have, I tell you, our police chief, um, the city of Delray Beach has a gym for a, a police chief. I mean, every time I call on him, he's always there. 
And when I don't call on him and I see him out in the community, he's always there. So we, we have something special here, uh, along with uh, you know the officers that, that are under him. And he's willing to work with us, uh, work with the community, and he's always out there in the community to let you know that he's there. So uh, the next person I'll have to come up here on the stage is our police chief, Jeff Goldman. All I can say is, uh, amen, it wasn't raining at 4 o'clock. So thank you, young people. Because two things, cops don't get wet, they don't get hungry. So I, I don't want to have to walk in the rain, or at least make my people walk in the rain and hold an umbrella. But uh, my name is Jeff Goldman, and, and I am blessed, and I'm truly blessed and honored to be the chief of police here in Delray Beach. And I do love Delray Beach. I love Pompano, too. I grew up in Hollywood. I love Pompano, but I love Delray Beach. I've been in Delray Beach for uh, 27 years. I've seen this city change a few times. And the one main thing that I always tell people is change happens when people come together. And, you know, right now in our society and our nation, the one thing we have to do is put back into the community is unity. And you've heard this before from other leaders, and I'm not going to say I made that, I stole it. But when you listen to that, when you put the unity back in the community, you can do anything. So what law enforcement has to do, and I can tell you what we do, I brag about our police department. The men and women in this police department are amazing people. Um, the reason why I put so much effort into getting out and meeting our community, what we call before 911, is because they're people. They are people. They're not what you see on television. Listen, there are bad officers, and I'll be the first one to tell you that. Ms. Greta said something, uh, some big words there, transparency and accountability. The police department should be transparent and accountable to their community. And, and I believe in that. So there are some bad ones out there. But you know what? There's a lot of good ones. So my job as a leader is to get these good ones out here, and I want you to meet them. I want you to meet them before 911. They're out here, they're making popcorn, they're making snow cones, they're talking to the kids. And that is the key component to ensuring public safety for our community is meeting your community before 911. You do not want to meet your officer that works your area when you dial 911. It's not a good day. You're not calling us to say, hey, come on over and let's have a cup of coffee. You got a problem. So if we've built that relationship, and that doesn't happen overnight, and what I tell my staff and I tell my community is the community is like a bank. You are a big bank. And we have to make these deposits constantly in the bank, coming out here with our trailer going to events, going to church, doing whatever we have to do, because, as the other gentleman will tell you, our profession is a high liability profession. Something's gonna happen. As good as we do it, as great Delray is, something might happen right here. I will never tell you that it can't happen here. But when it does happen, and I have to make that withdrawal, because I've made those deposits, all I can help is our community says, hey, you know what? That chief and that police department have been invested in this community, Let's give them a chance to tell us what's going on. If they're wrong, I'm confident that guy is going to take care of it. If he's saying they're right, they're right. And that doesn't happen overnight, and that's what we do. We make deposits in our community. Uh, I also want to say another thing. When it comes to the violence that you see around and, you know, our media, and we have some great media partners, and I saw our one Channel 5 here. They're here. Oh, there he is. Let me tell you about the media, at least around here. I've always heard a lot of things about media, and media does this, media does that. You know, shame on law enforcement when they don't reach out to these guys and ask them over and over again to come out of events like this. Because this is what law enforcement's about, right here. Not what we see on CNN or Fox and all that stuff with the five second video of whatever happened that we don't know, and then we're gonna make our own opinions. Right here, when we get the media to come out and talk to our community, uh, that's where the rubber meets the road. Because the story is told not by us. As much as we think that we're telling the story, right? I can talk to someone tomorrow that lives in Pompano or lives in Hollywood and they can say, Delray Beach Police Department, they're horrible. They're horrible, right? Why is that? Do you know what that is? There's, there's a theory. There's a theory out there that I believe in that most people, and I'm gonna say this, there are probably some here, right here, that have had contact with law enforcement, but most people don't have contact with law enforcement. They don't. The majority of the people make their opinion by someone else. So if a law enforcement officer has a bad day, 
and makes someone upset on a traffic stop or makes a bad police report, they've just made 100 enemies. That's what I tell my officers all the time. You've just made 100 enemies because that person's going to tell their uncle and their grandma and their kids. And every time they say the police, they're going to say, oh, that's the police that pulled over Uncle Jim. So what we have to do to fix that is have positive contacts. I'm telling you, the young men in here right now, if you've never had contact with police, you're going to remember getting a snow cone from that officer. You're going to remember getting popcorn because they want to serve. They want to give. And all we can hope is they grow older, they respect law enforcement just like we should respect them. Because just like families and children have lost a lot of respect, amen to that. Because I know that, I see it every day. People have lost respect for law enforcement. And the days of us asking someone to stop and let's have a chat with you have turned into uh, yelling and screaming and fighting and shooting and punching law enforcement. I mean, when I grew up, my mom and dad said, right or wrong, yes sir no sir yes sir no sir and if you got a problem you come back and tell me and I'll handle it and a lot of that starts at home and it starts in our schools and Delray does a great job with that and that's why you'll see these cops in schools you'll see them in churches because that's where the community's at so I could talk all day about these people because they do a wonderful job I do I have a great staff they're out here on Saturday some are off duty some are on duty I mean we bought this trailer just I don't know, a couple months ago, and uh, the idea was that we'd have another way to connect with our community. We came up with some crazy ideas to put snow cones in there and, and popcorn, and these guys all bought into it. They all bought into it. These are crime fighters. These guys that want to catch, they want to catch bad guys, I got them making popcorn and snow cones, so they get it. They understand the importance of it. So, again, I will come anytime I'm asked. Miss Greta knows that, Pastor knows it. I think it's important. <laughs> I think it's important. I really do think it's important that you have access not only to your chief of police, but your police department. So keep this going, keep the unity in community, and have a blessed day. I can keep talking, you know. I can keep on going. I can, Pastor will have to move over. I take over. I'll start preaching next. Now, does anyone have any questions for our chief? Because um, he has a prior commitment and he's going to have to leave early. So, if anyone has any questions uh, for him at this time, please um, let me know and we'll get it answered. Any questions? Because we thank you. Thank you very much. I thank you for that comment. And the one thing real quick I want to say that, that Ms. Greta did say is uh, law enforcement in general has to have the hard conversation. And those are uncomfortable. Even for me sometimes when, when even Ms. Ms. Greta or other community members say, hey, you know what, you guys are doing this, uh, you're doing something wrong, or so-and-so says this about your police department. If you just keep shooing those people away, that's going to come back to bite people in the butt. And that's what you see when you go ahead and you watch television. And if you Google certain jurisdictions around, I'm not even going to mention names, or community policing and problem solving, you're not going to see that. Because you have to sit down and you got to talk to your stakeholders and you got to have hard conversations. So although we're sitting here today and we're talking about a lot of things, you can find me. I'm at that police department. You ask for, for Chief Jeff. You come in there. You come down and talk to me, and uh, we will have that hard conversation. So thank you for today. Thank you, Chief. Thank you so much. First of all, I, Chief doesn't know that I'm, I'm going to do this, but I, I, I thought that this might be a good demonstration. I'm going to have you arrest me right quick. And, 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 and Because one of the things that I think oftentimes that we see and that we think about is the thing about resisting arrest. And so I kind of like for everybody to kind of get a, an idea of, of what that is, what, what determines or defines what is this resisting arrest is. And it's because we've had some of these conversations and sometimes we think or we see where somebody is being arrested and we hear on the video, stop resisting, stop resisting. And sometimes to many of us looking, it looks like the individual is being hurt while they're putting their hands behind their back. And the idea is it seems like if, if you're simply responding to some discomfort or some pain, that that 
sometimes it looks like that's being called resisting and then that has escalated to something or another. So I, I wanna, I wanna, if you just kind of walk us through how, if, if I'm being arrested, what should I do in terms of that or how should I respond to any discomfort or anything like that that might be perceived as being resisting arrest? Uh, that, that's a perfect question. Uh, two things I want to tell you about before I take them down and I'll put them in the grass. No. Um, two things first of all. There are studies out there, continuous studies from every university that says that it takes you about 20 to 30 seconds to process what you're seeing. So anytime you're watching a video of what someone's saying that they saw that law enforcement's doing bad, just remember there's 20 or 30 seconds that you're not seeing. So it takes you time to see and you're like, oh, pastor's getting arrested and oh, he's getting, he's getting punched. And then the video camera goes on. There's things that we don't know before that. Your police department here now is starting a body worn camera program, which I think is gonna solve a lot of that. The second thing that we'll talk about and I'm gonna show pastor is that even though I tell people that I used to be a cop, and I did, back in the day, now I just sit in the building and, and I get guys to come out and make popcorn. But um, I, uh, I was punched. I had someone pull a, a machete, machete on me. I've been spit on. I've had people throw planners at me. And so have these individuals. So what happens in the first contact when I see the pastor and I know he's going to go to jail, I need to make sure that he's not that guy. I don't know him. I don't know if he's gonna be the guy that's gonna to try to hurt me. So that's why, for our young people, when an officer tells you to do something, you just do it. You do it, and then if you feel like that you were abused or something was wrong, you tell your parents, you tell an elder, you come and make a complaint. But if, if you do everything I tell you to do, there's not gonna be a problem. There's not gonna be no resisting, there's gonna be no fighting, there's gonna be nothing. But what happens with most people is they don't wanna to go to jail. They don't. So when we say stop resisting, that could be as simple as, like we said, you said you were putting your hands behind your back, right? So uh, I, could t I, have, I have Terrence Scott here, one of our strongest guys in the world, and this guy, Sergeant Scott, raise your hand. He's our DT instructor, defensive tactics instructor. I, I, I challenge anybody in here, if he does not want to get handcuffed, you are not going to handcuff him. You're not going to handcuff him. I can tell you right now, that pastor's got, he's got some arms. All right. So if you put your arm out, put your arm out. And now don't let me handcuff you. Don't let me put your hand behind your back. Now look at this. And he's just simply just doing that. Now this turns into, sir, put your hands behind your back, to me now having to put his arm up and do this and then stop resisting. Now you've not seen any of that on the video. You didn't see any of that. You guys forgot, I forgot how to do that, right? All my cops out there. But you don't see that on the video. You just see this going on. So what we tell people is, sir, you're going to be under arrest. All right. Do you understand that, sir? You're going to be under arrest. You're going to be under arrest because you got a warrant because you were driving your car and your wife didn't know about it and she's in Tampa, so you better watch out. <laughs> Why are you over there? So if, he, if he's going to go peacefully, if we just talked about what we're going to talk about, right? You're going to go. You're going to be arrested. And I'm going to say, sir, please turn around. Put your hands out to your side. And if he does everything I tell him to do, I'm going to be able to search him. Now my, as a police officer, I am calming down. I'm relaxing. Okay, this is not that guy right now. He's not the guy that I remember 10 years ago that punched me in the face when I went like this. And everything is just put your left hand behind your back, the handcuff goes on, put your right hand behind your back, the handcuff goes on, and away he goes. That's how I can tell you, Pastor, and, I, and, I, and these officers can tell you the same thing, that's how the majority of the arrests go. They really do. They really, most people, when they're wrong, they're wrong, and they go to jail. The ones we see on television, the ones we see with our media are the ones that get ugly and people fight. And again, I preface it with saying that there are cops that do wrong. Right. There are. Right. And there are also pastors. There's also teachers that do wrong. But the majority of the profession is a good, noble profession. So it really has to do with commu police community relations, listening. Going back to what your mom and dad said. I hear this all the time in the community, and I remember because I started here in 1989. When Jeff Goldman got in trouble on Northwest 4th Avenue and I had to go walk home to Northwest 6th Avenue, I got my butt beat all the way by aunt and uncle and black captain and everything else. So that doesn't happen anymore. We don't have, we don't have that, that respect. And so when you're not respecting your elders, you're not respecting law enforcement. So that same thing just now, if I say to him, you got a warrant for your arrest, 
and he starts giving me some lip. First thing I'm thinking is, okay, why is he doing that? Has he got a gun on him? Has he got a knife on him? I'm, I'm looking him up and down. Now everybody's hearing it, right? Remember I said 20 to 30 seconds? All of a sudden now, now the part about me, him basically telling me to go get off, right? Cursed at me. That's not on tape. But what's on tape now is me saying, sir, okay, I've told you a couple times, I go to grab, and now the fight's on. That's what's on video. Derby Beach police officer beats up unarmed man. And, and so that's the stuff unarmed pastor. Yeah, he left his life. So, so the moral of the story is this, is, is to listen to law enforcement, compliant, and then complain later. Complain later. We have a process. We have internal affairs. We will investigate. Our men and women know it. But I can tell you the majority of them want to go home safe at night, just like you want to go home safe at night. So I thank you. Wait, no, no, come on. I didn't, I didn't see the mic stand. I was going to tell you to hold the camera on the camera. I'm sorry. Hey, you want to go to that, that's a great question. So she's talking about behavioral health, mental health, um, homeless. We have a large recovery community. So our officers are trained in crisis intervention. Uh, many of them are. We don't have a specific team that goes. The officers are trained in that. But if it rises to a level, like recently we had a young lady that really couldn't take care of herself too well, we contact South County Mental Hospital. They have a crisis team that comes out and evaluates. On that note, though, um, I have talked to my boss, who's a city manager, about getting a position, a civilian position in the police department that would be a um, advocate or a licensed clinical social worker that the officers could say, hey, listen, you know, Jeff Goldman's been a repeat offender, he's been homeless or whatever it is, you know, we, we, what can we do? And we can turn them over to uh, someone in the police department. So, but they are trained in crisis intervention and we have other avenues that they can uh, use. You're welcome. Yes, sir. So what rights do you have? Um, first of all, if it's a lawful stop, and that's, that's the key, is it a lawful stop? You know, our officers know it, and, and uh, they're governed by a lot of laws. People, and I know they don't like to hear this, but people don't have to give them their name unless they're doing an investigation. So if they're on a, a lawful investigation, yes, you have to give us your name. If, you, if they just want to come up and say hi to you, uh, and you're in the middle of the street, and you don't want to talk to them, you're just having a bad day, you can walk away. And if they try to do something, again, what I would say is, you go, like I told the pastor, you still got to comply and then you complain and say, I didn't do anything wrong. Otherwise, what your rights are, uh, just like you, know, you have the right to remain silent, you have all those different rights, all that is out the window, in my opinion, when the first encounter happens. That has to be a compliant encounter to have a successful conclusion, no matter what. Because the officer wants to go home safe and I know the individual that's getting arrested wants to go home safe. So as far as your rights and your, you have the you know, Constitution, there's tons of laws out there, there's attorneys out there that don't make lots of money suing police departments. Trust me, it happens. So what I would say is that in an encounter, if you feel you're completely right and you do nothing wrong and the officer is insisting, you ask for a supervisor first. You say, can I speak to your supervisor? Our officers know our policy says when you say that, they have to call a supervisor. So a sergeant comes out. If you're still getting the runaround and you're not happy with it and it looks like you're going to jail, now you have two decisions. One, you're gonna fight, and then that's not gonna be good. And the other one is you're compliant, you go to jail, and then you use the court system and you use our internal process to file a complaint against them. And that's, that's the best advice I can give you. Right, well, what will happen in that case, what he's saying is what if the handcuffs are on too tight? What the officer should do is, first of all, get you out of that situation, meaning like say we're at a crowd or in a bar or we're at the field, we're gonna remove you from the situation, get you away, and then they're gonna fix that. They will fix that. They have a way to actually tell how tight things are and things like that. They don't want, see, there, there's more paperwork that happens if actually an individual gets hurt. So they want less paperwork. So they're gonna make sure that if someone says my handcuffs are on too tight, they might not fix them right there because of the crowd, because of what's going on. Maybe people are yelling, screaming. They're gonna put you in the car, either take you to the PD and take them off, or if it's a long distance, 
they might stop and, and loosen them up. So um, it happens. It does because you know they don't mean to put them on tight, but if you're fighting, they're they're doing everything they can do to get you handcuffed. Because again, the bottom line is they are husbands and they are wives and they are brothers and sisters, and we have to humanize that. They want to go home. They want to see their kids. So just as bad as that, the individual wants to go home. Um, that's what I tell people. So we don't. They don't do it on purpose. It happens usually if it's a fight or someone's struggling. They've been trained. They go through training uh, quarterly. We have high liability training. We we do firearms. We do defensive tactics. We do handcuffing. Um, they do all that stuff. So when do they use their uh, firearms or any weapon of that sort? So that question comes up too. So when would they use their firearm? They will use their firearm if they feel deadly force is being used against them or against somebody else. The next question usually follows up with that is how come they can't shoot them in the arm or shoot them in the leg? Yeah. I can tell you this, that if a law enforcement officer is going to shoot someone because of deadly force, they're going to shoot to stop them. They're not going to shoot their arm, they're not going to shoot their leg. And then you can say whatever that's going to equal, shoot to stop them. Because if you shoot someone in the arm or shoot someone in the leg, first of all, you got to be a pretty good shot to do it. A lot of you see that on TV, that's, that's not real. Um, they're, they're trained to shoot for center mass on people for a reason, because the individual is going to kill, trying to kill somebody. So, but that, I, I can tell you, these guys, me, that, just saying that, I, I get cringed that I have to make that decision to take someone's life. And thank goodness I never had to go through that. We've had officers here that have, and uh, it's it's a it's a bad experience. It really is. I mean, they're trying to save themselves or the community, but it's not a not a pleasant thing. But, um, don't they, but aren't they supposed to see if the individual is armed, or can they just use a taser or whatever other weapon that they may have on them versus pulling out a gun? And Right. So the question is, is, you know, is there an escalation of force? And there is. They actually do. They have, we have uh, mace, we have tasers, uh, we have an asp, and we have the gun. And, you know, it's, it's their determination. Why they're on scene, you know, they're, they're, it's elevating. And that's why sometimes you do, you see these, uh, you know, the individual didn't have a gun. And, um, you know, the, I, I still believe, I mean, again, I know there's a small amount that are bad cops. I just don't believe that an individual woke up that morning and said they were going to kill someone that didn't have a gun. I just don't see it. But there are bad people. But saying that, they they go through a process of checking it out. What's the call, first of all? Was it a call with a man with a gun? Because I can tell you sometimes people do that to get the police there. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. You know, if they had a bad day with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they might call the police and say, man, I want to get the police there fast. You know how you do that? You say, man with a gun. So the cops are going to come. So now already they're thinking there's a guy there with a gun. And then it goes from there. If the individual is not compliant, then they're not going to use their taser. You know, they're going to use something else. So um, I, I think it all goes back to respecting law enforcement and doing what they say when they get to the scene. I know it's hard to say for some of our young people that have had bad experiences with law enforcement. I get it. But that's the only way to, to fix this whole problem is we show respect for us and we show respect for you. Any other questions? Oh. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, we, we have a complaint process, so if an individual feels like they were wronged by the police, we do have a complaint process. Now, what, when, when I say that is there's, you know, there has to be witnesses sometimes, you know, if there's other witnesses that see it. We've had many officers that have been sustained for doing things like that. Listen, we want to be just as transparent and accountable to our community. We don't want to be that police department that when you come over to our building, you're like, nothing's going to get done. And I, I don't want that. So um, we take it very seriously. Um, we have a whole policy on it. We actually were accredited by a uh, commission that looks at all of our standards. And so we are on our best practices on how we take complaints. Um, and you know, again, we'll investigate them all the way through from interviews. Now, the one good thing that about body cameras, and I know, you know, it goes back and forth. I think body cameras are good. I think they're good for police, but they're also good for community. Because I do think some of the frivolous complaints will come down because people won't just be able to complain on a police officer, they'll be on video. But a, a thing like that is a perfect example, is uh, we would have a body, hopefully a body-worn camera video to show that. And actually all of our cars have in-car cameras. 
So we're already videotaping anyways with video and audio. Uh, you know what, their video, you are all videoing us anyways is what I tell our officers, so we might as well videotape everybody else. So it's, a, it's an information rich society. Everybody wants more and more and more. You before, as a citizen, might want a police report. A week later, you want a police report now. You know, uh, when the shooting happened last night with an officer, you want to know now what happened. So we have to provide that. I mean, that's what, you know, if you try to hide that, um, you're not transparent and you're not accountable and then you just go down the tubes, you really do. If you lose, if you lose your community's respect, you can never police that community, you can never. We, we can be the best cops in the world and we have the greatest cops around here, but if our community doesn't trust us, we cannot ensure public safety. We can't do it. And that's what I tell them all the time, that the, 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 biggest, the biggest part to ensuring public safety is police community relations. That's it, that's it in a nutshell. So you respect us, we respect you, we all go home happy and we keep crime down and we have a great Delray Beach. So. Thank you very much, thank you everybody. Because of what happened to her grandson, Gerard Miller. And thank God we haven't had uh, another incident of that sort, at least that I know of, uh, of that sort. So uh, please uh, welcome Sister Phyllis Miller. No man is an island. No man stands alone. Each man's joy is joy to me. Each man's grief is my own. We need one another. So I will defend each man as my brother, each man as my friend. And this is what we need here, daughter of Zion. This is what we need, Delray. This is what we need with our police force, all of our officers, 11 years ago, when our family, my family, and this church family went through a tragic incident, we came together in grief, but in harmony. And I so appreciate all of the members of Daughter of Zion because it was, just as I just said, each man's grief is my own. We need one another. And in order to do that, we must stand together. We must support our police department. We must respect our police department. Because Gerard was what people really don't know. He was afraid of a fight. He will run before he would stand to fight. And that's one of the things that caused his demise because he was afraid and because of his fear he chose to run the police officer not knowing but thank God for the pastor that we had at the time thank God for the church members we held it together we loved we tried to forgive and trust me that is not easy, but when you have God on your side, yes. you learn how to forgive because vengeance is mine, yes. said the Lord. Yes. So we have to learn to respect one another. And when we learn to respect each other and the responsibility of each other's um, jobs that they have to do, just as uh, the chief was showing how an, an arrest should be made if we comply, if we do. And of course, there are some, some officers and some of us that still want to bully. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, if we keep God first and we learn to love and respect one another, and the one thing I want to say, daughter of Zion, we are going to be that lighthouse here in, Del in Delray. We are going to start and have others follow us. We're going to show them how to love. We're going to show them how to respect because we're going to stand together. We are not going to have so much anger at one another because it only brings about more and more and more anger. 
So if we can just stand together in love, if we can be stand side by side, and, and all of you that know that song, let's stand, grasp hands, and we want to sing that song because this, for me, what I should say is, if this is your theme, is this is what you would like to do, to be that lighthouse for this community. Let us stand together, let us hold hands, and sing this song, Side by Side We Stand. All of those who would like to let Daughter of Zion start out as being I know some of you officers and stuff don't know the song, but just stand if you are willing to comply. Stand and just grasp your hands with someone. And we're going to sing those and our young people that know the song. And at some point, you'll catch on to it. Pastor, you talk. I didn't ask you to sing. <laughs> I'm not going to stand here by myself. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Because we want them to know that we that we are going to be side by side. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, come on, you can say that better than that. Good afternoon, everyone. So good to see you for this wonderful occasion for which we have gathered. I tell you, as I listened to Chief Goldman, he said something that most policemen and police chiefs 
do not ever mention. And that is that they're good and bad policemen. You don't ever hear that very much, but they're good and bad in society. They're good citizens, they're bad citizens. They're good policemen and they're not so good policemen. And so we come together this afternoon to try to unify and have our community come together, both the corporations and the organizations in Delray, the citizens at large, law enforcement departments, all of us must come together and unify in a synergistic manner. We must pull together. For if divided, we stand, together we are going to fall. Hmm. And so what's happened, there's a lot of violence going on in our communities. Nobody wants to talk about certain things. But there are things that we must talk about if we are to heal. If we are to bring about change. And there are changes that need to be made. Nobody wants to talk about racism. But racism exists. Nobody wants to talk about it, but it does exist. So now if I'm sick with cancer and do not want to talk about it, do not want to let the doctor know that I do have cancer, I'm going to die because I have no treatment. And so we must stand together. We must be on the same page. We must come together in unity to be on the exact same page. Now there are many ways of reaching the same goal. So if there are many ways of reaching the same goal and there are first methods of reaching the same goal, then there should be no let down and nobody getting upset because it didn't go my way. We cannot say, if it does not go my way, then it's the highway. But what we must understand is that in this system that we're dealing with, there are a lot that is going on that people refuse to talk about. We sit here silently and we don't want to mention it, but we're thinking it. And if we want to bring about the healing that we need, then we need to talk about certain things. For example, there's a lot of violence going on in our community. You hear about black on black crime. You hear about Black Lives Matter. Well, you know what? That's not the real issue. When you say Black Lives Matter, what we're doing is taking away from the real issue that's going on. The real issue is that there's no accountability. Nobody's being responsible for things that happen. And nobody's answering for what is happening. In 2015, there were 215 black males killed in this country. The chief said they're good policemen and they're bad. I'm not talking about the good ones. Because thank God for law enforcement. Thank God for the good policemen. If it were not for them, we would be in trouble. I respect, I support, and I stand with them to the death. What do you mean, Pastor? I'm a Marine, ex-Marine. No, I'm not ex. When once a Marine, you're always a Marine. And when I stand with somebody, I give my whole 100% duty to it. I give you all I got. And so we stand with law enforcement. What I want to say is when we talk about Black Lives Matter, that takes focus away from the real issue. The real issue is, when we look at this, black people are citizens. We are Americans. Amen. We are Americans. And so the issue should not be the focus on whether black lives matter. All lives matter. I don't care what color you are. But the issue is accountability. Let me give an example. In our communities, when Ray Ray kills Tay Tay, the man is arrested, they're charged, they're prosecuted, and they get jail time. But 90% of the time when it's the opposite, when police kill Ray Ray or Tay Tay, in 90% of the cases, there's no accountability, there's no responsibility, and nobody is found to be accountable for what's going on. And I'm saying that's where the focus needs to change because policemen that are not good need to be accountable. I know I'm saying something that's very unpopular, 
But I'm not here for popularity. I'm here because we really want healing in the community. We really want to address the issues that need to be addressed. So what needs to happen, I teach my young people wherever I go, I teach them survival skills. Because you have good policemen. Listen, when those policemen out in California, out there were killed, my heart went out like everybody else. They have mothers and fathers. They have grandmothers and nieces and aunts and nephews that were in sorrow. It does, it's not right for any man to kill anybody. But if anybody does kill somebody, there should be accountability. There should be responsibility. And somebody's got to be ans answer to what's going on. And what is upsetting a lot of people that we're not saying is that they're upset but nobody's talking about it because nobody wants you to talk about racism. But it is alive and well. And we need to deal with it. So what am I saying? I'm saying this, the focus should be on citizens against police homicides. I'm talking about the bad police, not the good ones. What do you mean? I mean this. You let 215 Russian males be killed in this country by law enforcement, and Putin will call Obama and say if one more Russian is killed, there's going to be some accountability. You let 215 French male citizens get killed by law enforcement, and you better believe the French premier will call Obama and say there's got to be accountability. The same thing happens in China, the same thing happens in Britain. But when it happens here, everybody wants to be an ostrich and put their head under the sands and know it's okay. It's not okay. We're all accountable, not only to one another, but mainly we are accountable to God. And the scripture that say, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. That goes for law enforcement as well as the citizen. And I'm not knocking law enforcement, I'm talking about the bad ones. And you do have some bad ones, like you got bad citizens. So what that do is I close. I teach my young people that when you are stopped by a policeman, make sure, number one, that you have your license, your registration, your auto insurance, and a Velcro pouch, something like this. To clip it on your dashboard so that when the police stops you, keep your hands on the steering wheel. And then when they stop you, ask the officer, always be respectful. Law enforcement is there for a reason, like the chief said. You've got to respect the right law enforcement. So ask the officer, may I reach for my license? It's on the dashboard right here. If he tells you, then do it. Because if you reach for it and then get permission and they think you're going for a gun, that's another dead somebody laying on the ground. Not only that, always be respectful. Do what the officer tells you to do. Show him the respect whether he shows you respect or not. Because as a Christian, God wants you to show respect regardless. Then when you show the respect, then what you do, listen attentively and comply with what they tell you to do. There's an old proverb that says like this. When your head is in the jaws of a lion, you better be cool. You better be collected. Make no sudden moves. Walk softly. Be cool. And because if you don't, when you got your head in the jaws of a lion, if you don't keep your head, you may lose your head. And so when law enforcement stops you, if you get a bad one, your head is in the jaws of a lion. So you have to be cool. Be collected. Most people don't know African Americans are animated people. Sometimes when the police stop you, say, oh man, you can't do that. You can't say, because law enforcement, you may have a gun somewhere, you can't raise your hands at all, man. Just be quiet. Say as little as possible. Comply with what they're telling you to do, and you may live to see another day. That's for the bad ones. But I say again, thank God for the good policemen who risk their lives for us every day. We appreciate them. We applaud them. We honor them because, listen, you can't just, I'm going to be at my vet. I know what it means to put your life on the line. When these policemen go out, they don't know whether they're coming home or not. And so they put their lives on the line. But when you're stopped, follow the protocol, be cool, be respected. And most of the time, if you're dealing with a good one, you'll get home safe. So what? If they arrest you, shut your mouth. Go on to jail. You can talk about it later. Because your life will be there so you can talk about it.
But if you start, oh, I don't want to, why are you arresting me? Why are you doing this? No, leave it alone, let it be. Go on to jail. Your mama can deal with it later. The mayor can deal with it later. Brothers group can deal with it later. But you'll live. And so we're trying to bring about unity. Unless we unify on all levels, we're just playing the game. And we can't be playing games. It's too late in the game to be playing games. We've got to come together in unity. Law enforcement, the organizations in the community, and of course the community at large. I pray that God will help us, and I thank God for this gathering at Delray, what you're doing. Pastor, you're doing a great thing, man. Keep it up. May the Lord bless you. Uh, thank you for inviting the Florida Highway Patrol to your, to your event. Uh, I've done three other events similar to this down in Broward County where we've been into the churches and had the same discussion. And, and it's been positive at each church we went to. And there's a lot of issues around and we're not going to solve all the issues today. But by get starting this conversation is a start. And that's what we have to do to start the conversation, to start talking about what's going on in our community. Uh, like I said, I'm Sergeant Mark Wysocki. I've been with the Florida Highway Patrol for 35 years. I have a year and a half left and I'm going to retire. Also, we have Captain Kevin Strickland this year. He's a district commander for True Bell uh, Lake Worth, which handles Palm Beach County. He's also here. Uh, but like I said, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the traffic stop and what law enforcement thinks during a traffic stop and how everybody should react at a traffic stop. And I think what, you, what everybody has to realize in a traffic stop is that it, it's, law enforcement is dangerous as it is. And the traffic stop can be one of the most dangerous aspects of police work. From the standpoint that if something happens in your neighborhood and you call the Delray Beach Police Department and you tell them, I've got a fight in my neighborhood, there's 12 guys fighting, are, are they going to send one guy? <clears throat> Probably not. They're going to be able to send the amount of officers to handle the situation. So when we get out there and make that traffic stop, I get out there on the interstate and someone's doing, say, 90, 95 miles an hour. The big thing is, I don't know why they're doing 90 miles an hour. They may be just late for work. They may have to go to the bathroom. Who knows? They may have just committed some criminal act or left that fight at Delray Beach and they've jumped on the interstate and they're flying south. So, for the most part, as I walk up to that car, I'm concerned with what's going on inside the car. If there's two or three people in the car, I want to see hands. I want to see what's going on inside the car. And also, while I'm walking up to the car, I'm now standing next to traffic. He's doing 60 or 70, 80 miles an hour right next to me within two or three feet that I'm turning my back on, that I can't see what's going on behind me because I want to focus on what's going on inside the car. And you, you just look at the traffic stop and, and from that aspect of worrying about being run over by people that aren't paying attention, they're on their cell phone, they're texting, whatever they're doing in the car, and as I'm walking up to the car. And like the pastor said, if you can have your, your driver's license, insurance, and registration all in a, in a safe spot that you can grab it. Because in a lot of these discussions that we've had at the other churches, they've talked about, where should we keep our driver's license? Should we keep it up in a spot that's easy, easily accessible? I say yes, if you can, but just to remember to take it, you know, put it back in your wallet when you get out of the car. Because if you go to reach for something, if you reach and say you have a gun in your glove box, you know, that's going to cause a reaction from the, from the officer. If he sees what appears to be a gun, or if you make that, that quick movement, you know, that's what we're trained. We're, we're trained to react to stuff. And that's why it, it's so important in the traffic stop that just, we have to communicate. We have to communicate what's going on. We're going to communicate what happened. You know, you're probably not going to like the outcome a lot of times because, you know, with law enforcement, we're, we're primarily a traffic-related agency. So we deal with enforcement and, and education. And sometimes as part of that education becomes the enforcement. And, and we may issue you a ticket. And the side of the road is not the place to have court. You know, we have a system that you can go to court. We have a system that if that officer is having that bad day, and, and a lot of the, the way a traffic stop's gonna end up is gonna be the conversation between you and, and the officer or the trooper. If he's having a bad day and starts, you, what, what, you, look what you're doing. That's gonna set you off right away. You're, not, you're gonna be upset now. And the same way as the officer. If you react the same way 
to a, to, he's telling you why you're stopped. Well, I wasn't doing that. I wasn't doing 90 miles an hour. I was only doing 65. Okay, well, here's my training. Here, I, I clocked you on radar. I did this. I explained how I, how I clocked you, what you did wrong, and I'll issue the ticket. And then you have the option of, of, of appearing in court and testifying in court, and we go before a judge. And if you have the, the problem with the officer, it's not the place on the side of the road. We have protocols, just like Delray Beach has protocols, to, to file a complaint against, against a trooper. And we do follow up on our complaints. Our supervisors follow up, and then it, goes, it can also go to an internal affairs division also that will look at your complaint. We look at all complaints, and we take whatever action is necessary for any trooper that's involved. And just a couple of the other circumstances that have happened recently within the last year or so involving traffic stops. Uh, we, had a, we had a gentleman that was traveling northbound on 95. He violated the move-over law. The trooper pulled, a, pulled the person over, gave him a false name. The person had recently been on America's Most Wanted. He was a high school guidance counselor that was uh, trafficking in child pornography and been on the run for three years. Just caught him and just happened to catch him on a traffic stop. Same area in, in Melbourne. Trooper walks up to a car that doesn't have lights on. There's a 16-year-old girl in the, dri in the driver's seat and a 15-year-old passenger in the, in, the, in the front seat of the pickup truck. The trooper has a conversation with the driver. The 15-year-old boy gets out a gun and shoots the trooper. The trooper returns fire and kills the 15-year-old boy. But it just turns out, you know, you never know what someone's thinking. This 16-year-old and 15-year-old were from Central Florida. They were heading to Ohio to go to commit suicide together. So you, you never know what's going to happen inside that car. And just, I just noticed in, in a news clip today, we had a trooper that uh, arrested a murder suspect on I-10. Uh, just driving around uh, in, in Florida, he was stopped for a violation. It turns out he was a murder suspect and we made the arrest. So you have to understand that traffic stop is really, you know, we just don't know. We don't know what's going on inside the traffic stop. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. I would say, you know, let the officer know. Just let him know you're carrying, so he knows. Because if he sees something, obviously, if you have it on, if you have it on, uh, if you have a permit, you can carry it on you. You can carry it wherever you need to. If you don't have a permit, you can have your gun in your car. There's nothing no says that says you can't have a gun in the car, even if you don't have a permit. But it just has to be, if it's readily accessible to you, say it's in a pouch, and you and it's under your seat, and that pouch is zippered, you're fine. If that pouch is unzippered, where you can just reach down and grab that gun and pull it up, that's a problem. Any other questions? Yes. Not to pray for him. 
we have a good environment. And I pray for you, police. And I love you. May God keep continue to bless you. Thank you very much. Yes. If you own a firearm, does it have to be registered? I can't hear you. If you own a firearm, does it have to be registered? No, it doesn't have to be. You do not have to register as far as I know. You can just have a weapon. You know, if, if you bought it from a gun shop, they'll go through all the information. And like I said, you can carry the weapon, uh, but it just has to be secured in a car. Anybody else? Okay. Call in and ask questions. And, and somebody asked a question a couple weeks ago about the video cameras. He said, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have all these video cameras? I said, yes and no. Because yes, we can see stuff, but no, because we're not seeing all of it at the same time. It'd be so much nicer if we could just let an investigation come to its end before we're making all the judgments. Okay, what, what I would say a little bit to that point is that, you know, at least the Florida High Patrol, and I believe your, your police chief said that your your department has body cam, going to body cameras, and has video cameras in the car. We also have video cameras in probably about 75% of our fleet around the state of Florida. And our sergeants and supervisors are taxed with the responsibility of reviewing those, those traffic stops. And so anytime you're stopped by a trooper, of the 75 cents that have the, the cameras right now, it's all on video. So it's something that we'd be able to look at as a department, as a supervisor, if they see these things happening, it's something that they can note and then pass on to the upper management on what's happening to be able to take the, the action necessary that would be needed. Well, all that stuff, all, all the initial training is done in our, our training academy that deals with how to make a traffic stop and the right way to do a traffic stop to, to do it correctly and properly. I, I think it, it, it probably does. I'm not going to say it didn't. I mean, it, it does. Like, like the chief said, there's good officers. There's bad officers, there's good lawyers, there's bad lawyers, there's good doctors, there's bad doctors. Every profession has their good and their bad. You know, and you, you hope that me as a law enforcement officer, as being an officer, a trooper for 35 years, you know, it embarrasses me when it happens because it's not what I signed up for. I signed up because I enjoy traffic, 
I wanted to do traffic. I wanted to be able to protect people and do a good job. So, you know, as part of that education enforcement is too many people are dying on our highways. And we had almost 2,500 people killed, about we average about 24, 2,500 killed a year on Florida's highways, just in the state of Florida. So, you know, our job, you know, as you see on our, on our patrol cars now, our front plate says arrive alive. And that's what we're, we're tasked to. We want people to arrive alive. And that should be your ultimate goal as you go out and drive, is to arrive alive at your destination by wearing your seatbelt, not drinking and driving, obey the speed limits, obey the traffic laws in the state of Florida. I just want to jump in real quick. Um, I know I got to speak later, but the different police departments have different measures in place. When I was a police officer in Cass County, Georgia, which is predominantly a black um, county up there in the area I work, what we had in place was we had, um, when a police officer conducted a traffic stop, they would document who they stopped. And unfortunately, that allowed, I mean, actually that allowed us to identify the tendencies of what each officer had regarding when they conducted the traffic stop. At the same time, I had one of my academy mates who was another black male officer who we identified who was actually pulling over black females in high dollar vehicles. And eventually he ended up getting terminated um, for that. So it goes on um, both sides, but, but there are different police departments. Understand there, there are over 17,000 um, police departments throughout the um, United States, and that's over 800,000 police officers. So each um, department sometimes has different standards in place. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to um, share with you, that there are departments that have these type of um, metrics in place. And we also have that, we have a traffic stop data form. Also, it, it says why they were stopped, the, the reason for the stop, what enforcement action was taken, were there any pedestri or pedestrians, any passengers in the car, and all that stuff is documented on a traffic stop data form that we also have to fill out. Yes, we are ladies, always have our driver's license in our purse. So, if we get stopped, we are not allowed to take it off our bag. Because you were saying we should have it ready to be caught up. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> we said that's an option. That's an option for you to do that if you want to keep it close. But if, if it's in your purse, you just tell the officer, my driver's license and insurance card is in my purse. And he may ask you, do you have a weapon? No, I don't. And then, you know, I mean, you can then bring your purse to your lap where he can see what's, what's going on. He can see you reaching in your purse. He can see you reaching your wallet. He can see that you're getting your driver's license. Like I said, it's, it's all about us seeing things and communicating things to you, what, what we need, and you communicating back what, where it is. Okay? Yes. <laughs> this question doesn't have anything particularly to do with arrest or anything like that. Can you explain the move over law? Because that one is kind of confusing because I've seen people literally like break and almost cause an accident trying to move over to a packed lane to the right. So can you explain that to us a little bit? Sure. Uh, the Florida move, move over laws for law enforcement, um, EMS, fire rescue, tow truck drivers, and it was recently added utility workers such as FPNL, Comcast, and your sanitation workers. So the first part of the move over law says if there's a law enforcement officer stopped on the side of the road with the lights flashing, you need to move over one lane away from the officer. The second part of the law says if you can't move over, you have to slow down 20 miles an hour below the posted speed limit. But unfortunately, we all know that's an impossibility to do on, on an interstate highway. That if, you, if, you're, if you're running 65 or 70 and you're paying attention, called not on your cell phone, and you see the flashing lights, you should immediately start to, start to see if you can move over. And if you can't move over, at least start slowing down. Don't slam on your brakes, because that's probably going to cause, cause the other accident. And then where, where that 20 mile per hour below the posted speed limit really is gonna come into effect is, is basically on a two lane road where you can't move over, that the officer stopped on, on the side of the road, 
you want to slow down to 20 miles an hour below the posted speed limit. So, so those are the two factors that you're looking for for the move over law. And, it, it, in, and now that you have the sanitation workers, technically if your sanitation workers are picking up trash in your neighborhood, whatever the speed limit is in your neighborhood, if it's 25, you should be doing five miles an hour when you pass them. It's for their safety and, and law enforcement safety. Uh, we've all seen how many accidents, you know, law enforcement gets involved in just conducting the traffic stops. And the thing is, you will see a lot more officers that walk up to the right side of the car now. I know, especially on the interstate system, like I said, when I'm standing here, and I got traffic doing 80 miles an hour right next to me, two or three feet, it doesn't take much for that person to reach for their cell phone or, or look at one of their kids and just swerve right in and, and hit me. But, uh, but actually, the right side of the car has dangers also. You know, on the interstate, we're dealing with high speeds. So a lot of times when I stop cars, I would try to stop a car where there's no guardrail. I, I don't want to stop a car on a bridge because if I'm on that right side and that car gets hit, I have no avenue of escape. I, I'm now pinned between the bridge. I'm pinned between the guardrail. I don't want to jump off a bridge. So sometimes, you know, we may observe a violation and we may wait a mile to where there's a safe spot but there's very few safe spots left on the interstate anymore also because there's so many guardrails. They're, they're widening the interstates. You know, the inside median is a dangerous spot too because people are going just as fast, and if not faster, in the left lane. But, you know, if, if, you, if you do get stopped, it's okay to go to the left. If you're in the left lane and you're trying to get all the way across five or six lanes to the right, it's okay to go to the left. Yes, you can if you want to wait till there's a lighted area. But what what I would do is put on your emergency flashers, so the officer know now knows. Okay, she, you know she's she's recognized that I'm behind her. You know, uh, it, it, a lot of it depends on what road you're on. If you can get to a parking lot, you know that's lighted. You know, if it's if you don't see any lights on top of the car, say it's like an unmarked car. We have very few unmarked cars. Our supervisors have unmarked cars, but our most of our patrols have marked units. So we're going to have lights on top. We're going to have lights in the window. We're going to have plenty of lights. So if you're, if you're concerned, you know, say it's an unmarked car, you just see maybe one light. You don't see a top light. You don't do anything at You're a female. The officer walks up, says in plain clothes. Don't roll the window. Just roll the window down just a little bit so you can see. Because we're not, we're not supposed to make traffic stops unless we're in uniform for the Florida Highway Patrol. You know, so that way, um, and if, if we do, it would have to be an extreme emergency. Like, you, you're saying a, a drunk driver that's running off the road and may seriously injure or kill someone, we're probably going to make that stop. But for the most part, most law enforcement officers, if they're in, say they're in their SWAT gear like that, you know, if they're in SWAT gear, they're going to have some identification on them. But if there's just someone that says a best police and you don't see a badge, you don't see an ID card, you know, ask to see their ID because they should have an ID card with them. Anyone else? Oh. Uh, when it comes to speed, 